So we will just close the slides for a while. Yeah, sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to 148th weekly session from Simao. We are live on various social platforms and on Simao Forum. Uh, we welcome all our uh, members from Simao Group, all the audience on this forum. Uh, today, we are talking about prevention of severe allergies. I think this is a topic which everybody wants to know. We all are getting allergies these days in the various environment and climate conditions. So how to prevent that? We have Dr. Vijay Warar talking on this topic. He's an MBBS and MD consultant allergist, the pediatrics pulmonologist, clinical immunologist, consultant at Sai Allergy Asthma Eye Hospital, uh, Shardi Hospital, Inamdar uh, Multi-Speciality Hospital. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Soro, for the very kind introduction. And very nice to meet all of you from all over the world. So happy morning, happy afternoon, happy evening, according to that. And as we know, the time has changed and the disease patterns are changing. Overall, considering like NRI patients also regularly they visit in India during the holidays and our own patients also, we have found allergy has increased not only the developed country, but developing countries like India also. We are seeing a lot of surge into that. And previously, 25, 7, 20, 30 years back, hardly one anaphylaxis in a six months we used to see. But nowadays, at least three to four patients in a week we are getting with anaphylaxis with a very severe allergy. And considering these things, the treatment part too, we all are managing, depending on the our own circumstances, our patients' awareness about the allergy management and the affordability, the testing costs, so many things are into that. But the future will be, if we can prevent these severe allergies, whatever the tendency of the children to have such a severe presentations, as well as the potency of the allergens has increased, because of pesticide use, specifically in Indian scenario, a lot of pesticides are used into the farming and artificial fertilization uses. Then the cosmetics, indoor, so many floor cleaners, door cleaners, perfumes. The changing lifestyle, the diet has changed from Mediterranean to the Western type of diet. So we are also having a lot of McDonald's and so many outlets, pizzas, burgers and it uses colors into the food and all. Then sudden change into the diet patterns, like whatever the traditional diet people used to consume now, so many in even in the winter and rainy season, people are eating ice creams and cold drinks and so, so uh, even all packed bottles and canned foods. So these are all causing a lot of allergies. So I will try to discuss with all and so we can have a, interaction and how we can it can be really useful to the community so basically still last 34 years i have seen a lot of misconceptions amongst the communities there they feel whenever a child having a repeated cough cold or throat infection tonsils or whatever, most of the people talk key, the immunity is low still i mean many of the people but is it that way absolutely not Basically, allergy is a hypersensitivity disease. Even so many alternative pathy people, they talk to the patient that they will increase the immunity and they will reduce the allergy. It can't happen because it is a hypersensitivity disease. Basically, the sensitization goes on happening one fine day when the mast cells become hyperactivate, then the overflow of symptoms start. So it is a hypersensitivity disease. It's not a lower immunity. So even... Uh, most of our colleagues also, that awareness should be brought that we should have a uniformity while explaining to the patient that it is not a lower immunity, it is a hypersensitivity. Definitely, there is a TH2, TH1 imbalance. That's why some of the patients, when the TH2 inflammation increases and the TH1 cells goes down, then the secondary infections happen. So even in India, the Chase Research Foundation did a study and so many deaths are happening because of the asthma, chronic respiratory diseases, 
obstructive sleep apneas leading to paralysis blood pressure problems secondary pneumonias heart problems in a severe asthma patients and this chronic exposure which is happening day in and day out with the indoor allergens into the car pollutants car uh, funguses mites then pigeon feather droppings like in pune mumbai like urban cities a lot of pigeon feathers are there in the pigeon feather there are 17 types of dust mites then the droppings also aspergillus cryptococcus food allergy cases are increasing now because of as i explained about these things the we are also seeing a lot of food allergies nowadays so what happens here is and the concept should be that the skin dendritic cells they go on sensitizing and most of the children they are around with the mother or grandparents playing with the grains and all so these grains and all they cause sensitization to the dendritic cell to the skin when the pH2 memory cells increase the intolerance starts happening and once the child grows up when he consumes the same foods whatever the peanut milk or eggs and all he will start having a symptom of food allergy eczema rhinitis sinusitis and all so as a practitioner our aim is that we should educate to our colleagues that symptomatically we are all managing the patients but considering how we manage the diabetes how we manage the blood pressure the same way the allergy management concept because once allergies always allergy tell we don't manage in between there can be a window period like sort of a lot of eczema children they overcome the eczema a lot of colleagues or grd 40% have a food allergy so they may overcome the grd but later on they may go into rhinosinusitis divit and nasal septum rhino conjunctivitis it's a big problem now 95% of the rhinitis children have a hidden ocular allergy go on rubbing the eyes go on rubbing the nose go on rubbing the ears and later on may go into obstructive sleep apnea sinusitis adult onset asthma and all specifically considering uh, indian scenario it's a number one chronic disease among children third leading chronic disease among all ages and to, uh, up to the 2023 prediction is that 30% of the population will suffer with the significant allergy I, as i mentioned significant why because recently one study was done in india and it has found ki 70% of the populations they consume the anti allergics as a common cold or something and but many of them are having anti allergics regularly in their diet so we'll see the case wise like we had a significant ocular allergy child it was from a rural area around 65 kilometers from pune uh, and in a rural area also he had multiple sensitivities and some pollens the dust mites he was suggested the intraocular steroids but somebody referred to us and when we found the sensitivity to the child we guided him about the safe some environmental control some simple precautions and then whatever the advanced therapies have been there we had a total ig 110 for his age it is higher we started on omalizuma biologics and he is within 4 to 6 months he got such a nice regression into the inflammation and field cancer also started diminishing and he was much better so it was basically a parthenium or english plantain sensitivity was there and dust mite sensitivity was also very significant so whatever he used to have a regular blanket there were a lot of dust mites are always there into the bed and all this was a 14 years child with a significant growth retardation visited many pediatricians chest physicians pediatric pulmonologists most of the investigations were done even the bal was done for any infections and all but when we examined you can see the long eyelashes here a denny morgan folds also and the white and prosopsis this prosopsis yellow flower pollen they travel around 130 kilometers and so it it is a very big problem in india with the prosopsis peltoforum these pollens so you can see the turbinate hypertrophy the dark circles still over here this was a 12 years old with a significant previous history of snoring repeated infections consulted many doctors he was put upon inhaler so many things but when we identified allergen so we guided them about some simple precautions actually he was uh, suggested a adenoidectomy also but that not does not require because nowadays it has been found ki very significant if the child is having a significant sleep apnea and all then only we should operate for the rest of the time we can manage with the nasal steroids with environmental control the desensitization nasal dousing and these are very good and helps the 
students. This is a child referred from a corporate tertiary hospital for a three episodes of significant wheels required admission into the ICU also. And already they had visited the dermatologist, pediatricians, and most of them had said, like looking at the severity, at the age of three months, he started having an eczema. So he was counseled, the parents were counseled that he will take some time around eight to 10 years, 12 years. So uh, this continue with the water, the moisturizations and all. But you can see over here, the long eyelashes, depressed nasal bridge also. And once we identified, you are having a milk and dust mite sensitivity. We avoided that milk in the milk products also. We started desensitizing uh, the dust mites with the sublingual immunotherapy. And within nine months, the child showed such remarkable results. Even not only his respiratory symptoms come down, he did not require a single admission the last four years, he's following with me. But within nine months, his skin also showed a very marked improvement because the dust mites are in crores into the, uh, in millions into the beds. The, the, whatever the deep cushions, the car cushions everywhere. So these simple precautions should be guided today. This was from a very good family. This child had been to us from a cornea specialist. Having an early age cataract because of the repeated eye steroids. You can see the periocular eczema also. And last six months, his school life was affected. The children used to bully him. How you are having such a lower immunity. You are so sick child and all that way. And they, would, they would used to say, bully him like, don't go close to him. So even not only the allergies, the symptomatically, even uh, school bullying is into the nun, into the children's. Psychologically, these children feel why I am suffering so much avoid us of so many foods and all so even it has a psychosomatic changes also into the patients so this child if you see he had a initially gastrointestinal symptoms then skin symptoms then foot problems uh, asthma he was on inhaler nebulizers and all this was an allergic march was continued in spite of symptomatically he was better in between but later on he had a significant you can see how much papillary he had so this was a Child delivered from a corporate hospital from the PICU after Alicia. This child had a peanut butter and he had a significant anaphylaxis and he was admitted into the ICU. Then after that recovery also, the hypoxia, whatever had happened, the child required a lot of time for coming out of that. Now having a repeated cough, cold, antibiotics and all. That's why, and he had a significant dust mite sensitivity. Even the peanut butters and all, because of the repeated putting the hands and into that, these human danders, they fall into that. And the contamination also happens. And this was a significant oral allergy syndrome. Very few cases are that. I discussed with international bodies also about this because peanut, he did not have a significant sensitivity. Even we did the component dissolved diagnosis also, everything. Even skin test also. So dust mite contamination was into that. So if you see pharmacotherapy wise, most of these patients are repeatedly treated with first generation, second generation antihistamines. In our setups, a lot of first generation antihistamines are given. It affects the sleep cycle of the children. It has a long term cognitive behavioral disturbances. We presented a paper in uh, Toronto. Like a lot of children have the side effects of these first generation. So, whenever our kids should use, they should use a safe non blood brain barrier crossing, non sedative antihistamines because these children require a long term management with the antihistamines. Then, monotonic cast, whenever it is required. Judicious use is recommended. Then, mast cell stabilizing medication, specifically ocular allergy. As I mentioned, 95% of the children they go on rubbing the eyes. That the rubbing will cause again the capillary breakage and dark circles, as well as it will cause a corneal irritation. The keratoconus cases we are seeing a lot of cases with the keratoconus cases at the age of 14, 16 years. So the good eye drops with the mast cell stabilization as well as oral medications like even oloptadine or vilastin and all in a higher dose, four times higher dose with the phexocanadine also can be given in these patients to control the mast cells and inflammation and good antihistamine control. Then this is modifying therapy is the immunotherapy. And that awareness should be brought into the community because still people don't know about allergy vaccines, desensitization or immunotherapy in India. So very few experts are into this field. It is very time consuming to explain to the patients and all but it is rewarding to the patients to reduce the symptoms also, to reduce the medications also, and to stop the further progress of the disease, further sensitivity, and further complications also. So whatever the medications we are using, besides that, most important, how in diabetes, 
we educate to the people about simple diet control exercise the same way these patients if we identify the allergens at least and if we can guide them what type of dust mite control should be done what type of mold control and all this ari gina guidelines even the gold copd guidelines have mentioned environmental control for that patient is very important and for that it will help to reduce the inflammatory cycle so as the children go on into adolescence and adults their eczema food allergy may or but they land up into rhinitis rhinoconjunctivitis sinusitis asthma obstructive airway disease adult chronic respiratory diseases so as the child grows the food sensitization goes down in india we don't have that much food sensitivities as compared to the western countries but still definitely the cases are increasing then aero allergen sensitizations also increase with the way and as the child grows when he has a one or two sensitizations he goes to few few to multiple again to sensitivity and the potency increases and then they have overflow symptoms this allergic march while treating these patients has to be considered and according to the age these different type of presentations can be there but now it is a vice versa also some of the children they start with the early uh, multi trigger wheeze or atypical wheezes and then they may go into adolescent eczema adult eczema also even nowadays we are seeing some adult food allergies also significantly so this concept of minimal persistent inflammation which is going on which is having a newer sensitivity pattern should be into the patients so 35 to 40 percent of allergic rhinitis may have a asthma 40 to 50 percent patients with allergic rhinitis also have a asthma 50 percent of the patients with asthma alone develop the rhinitis and 70 to 90 percent of the patients with asthma also have a rhinitis so specifically children out of children nine children have always underlying allergy adults also 65 to 80 percent of the adults they show the significant skin sensitivity so these are the primary allergens the awareness is important because recently two years back in the european academy we presented a paper around 16800 significant chronic respiratory asthma patients and most of the questionnaires when we took from the patients they had a complaint about the foods but when the tests were done it was actually the airborne allergens or environmental allergens and you can see like these are the commonest one more than 92 to 95 percent of the people have an environmental or airborne allergens so why preventing these patients the primary secondary and tertiary prevention should be considered in a primary prevention the development of an atopic disease and abnormal allergic responses in a healthy children without any evidence of abnormal allergic immune responses so target population is the general population as well as the high risk neonates and all so how we can achieve that even there are very good uh, like farm dust exposures cow dung exposure whatever the poo of that which has a natural endotoxins and probiotics which prevent these children so these exposure also should be there like a hygiene theory we call even nowadays nuclear family were there previously joint families used to be there so the children used to have a natural infections so they used to have a th1 immunity now because of the nuclear families and having all these artificial indoor allergen and pollutant exposures they are having a more th2 inflammation secondary prevention development of the new atopic disease or the new abnormal allergic immune response in children with already established clinical symptoms or abnormal allergic immune responses to so target group are the into atopic dermatitis or early sensitization to hens egg or cow's milk so last four years i was working with the allergy prevention committee of world allergy organization and the specific was on only like So we can prevent the food allergies and atopic dermatitis, and uh, now it has been recently published into the World Allergy Organization journal. Tertiary prevention is the progression of the severity and exacerbations of the already established allergic disease. So those patients which have already moderate to severe allergic disease, whatever asthma or rhinosinusitis or something, they may develop again more sensitivities. They may develop a very severe inflammation and severity of the disease may increase. So how we can have it so there are studies done higher intake of food based vitamin d reduce the risk of their children getting allergic rhinitis or hay fever then again some of the studies they did not find a link in vitamin d so there are always some postulations we require more studies then leaf study was done 
and it showed that infants at a high risk for peanut allergy who regularly ate small amounts of peanut protein were less likely to develop the peanut allergies. The persistence of the oral tolerance to peanut in revealed that the same at risk infants still did not develop a peanut allergy even after they had avoided eating peanuts for over one year. So this early introduction, specifically in the Indian scenario, that is done since ages. So that's why maybe we did not have much uh, food allergies. Then again, feeding like four to six months old babies with the peanut powder or diluted peanut butter and that risk of peanut allergy by 80% was found. Feeding young babies, common food allergen teaches their immune system to tolerate the foods. And there are some US and European guidelines on that. And early food introduction, then avoiding the tobacco smoke, pollution, certain viruses, the RSV and all may prevent the asthma. So many of the grandparents and all, they smoke outside and they come inside. But that smoke will be always exhaled up to two to three hours. So that should be also be educated. In Indian scenarios, still tobacco burning is done to clean the teeth in the early morning. It is called misery in the local language. Then even the firewoods are still burned into the rural urban slums. Then again, best to is very important. It has multiple factors. We all know that it is very useful up to six months. Exclusive breastfeeding still is done in most part of India. So maybe that's why we don't have much allergies as compared to the Western country. So even there are studies that consuming milk in the first trimester, eating wheat in the second trimester, reduce the risk of atopic dermatitis, eczema. Dust mite allergy is a predictor of asthma atopic dermatitis in children. As the child has a significant sensitivity in the early age, more chances of severe allergy disease afterwards. And those children where significant milk allergy is there, then hydrochloric formula or amino acid formulas should be used so that the severity of the sensitization can come down. Because most of the children, they overcome the milk allergy as they grow. Then there are two top sorts of barrier repair. So some of the people, research says that a good barrier to the child in an early stage. That's why nowadays, previously, the Bengal gram and milk massage used to be given, coconut oil and all. Nowadays, we don't recommend that because it may have a sensitivity from there. So now the research-based product should be used and the barrier should be improved. Then again, as I mentioned, the breastfeeding benefit, immunotherapy, definitely there are a lot of studies worldwide, more than 100 years the immunotherapy has been practiced and the selective patients with specific standardized allergy testing, we can help these patients to stop the severity of the disease and the progress. So the future is on probiotics and biologics. So the probiotics, the studies are happening, they are much useful in atopic dermatitis prevention and all. Still, respiratory infections and the allergic rhinitis and asthma, the uh, trials are going on. So, toll-like receptors and all, they will have an activation of the dendritic cell and TH1 response. So, the TH2 inflammation goes down. So, you can see this picture elaborates very nicely. So the probiotics has a different actions at a different level, or the interleukin level, at the reduction of the TH2, improvement in the IgA, improvement into the phagocytosis, interferon gamma, TNF beta factor, then reduction into the IL4, IL5, IL13 level. And so that's why multiple actions are there. When there is a gut lung, gut brain axis, so this, all the gut is very important. So the more research will be required and this will be a feature. So natural infections, they prevent the severity of the allergies, hygiene therapy, as I mentioned. These risk factors in a early onset persistent atopic dermatitis, then early dust mite sensitivities, multimorbid, then environment like urban and crowded without any sunlight and all, that again has that. Epidural barrier defect, cutaneous inflammatory responses, atopic multimorbidities, then complementary feedings and symbiotics, these all help to understand the patients about how we can reduce the severity of the allergies. Now, allergy testing, still in Indian scenario, very few patients go for the allergy test. They don't know about that, how it is significant as like a blood sugar into the diabetes. So there are a lot of, I mean, most of the countries they are doing that. You can see all the European Academy, World Allergy Organization, 
even indian college of allergy asthma and neurology she also is recommending significantly early detection will help to reduce the newer sensitivities and environmental control can definitely help to reduce the severity of the allergy into the future so these are the ig mediated diseases where the food or food allergy or environmental allergens contact allergen testing helps misconceptions among the community and a lot of elisa method food allergy food intolerance tests are done those should not be promoted because food allergy intolerance tests are not clinically significant it does not uh, correlate clinically to manage these patients so even in a early stage it should be rather than in a severe asthma and all it may not help that much so the awareness among the population among our colleagues should be that because most of the patients now we get it that when this allergy is very severe rather than that when we suspect an allergy and if you select few of the allergens and if you do the test it helps more than the patient goes into the complications and coming to allergy specialist so these as i mentioned the how the standardized skin allergy tests are helpful in most of these patients even indian college of allergy and immunology in 2017 i was also part of that and we had such a very well guidelines how the allergy focus medical history because it takes a lot of time one patient around 2 to 3 hours for his exposure what type of uh, very where he goes how many how many kilometers the child has to travel in a bus which type of vehicles they are going all these things even how much air conditioning into the vehicle because these air conditioners into the cars and all they suck so many pollen so the pollen filter should be there into that so allergy diagnosis by the skin prick test or specific ig blood allergy test or component result diagnosis like multiplex assay methods then allergen avoidance should be educated to these patients not only allergen avoidance but along with that the indoor and outdoor pollutants also avoidance or in during the winter a lot of smog that traps all these pollutants down so the people should be aware when there is a cloudy weather lightning it breaks these pollens in a very minute particles and they rush in more into the deep into the nasal mucosa and sinuses so there also we should guide them to use the mask then secondary viral infections we called uh, infancy uh, viral syndromes like the children when they go into the nursery and pre nurseries they get a repeated infections and secondary infections will trigger more inflammation so that also should be educated to that so what type of test so many tests are done uh, and so many advertisements are done into the newspapers by the laboratories and all but what are the international and as well as in indian scenario also we have found that the standardized skin prick allergy test in some of the patient the specific ig blood allergy test specifically food allergy patients it helps whenever the rhinitis rhinosinusitis asthma upper airway cough syndrome tonsillitis adenoitis and all the skin prick test is the gold standard you can see like even world allergy organization has said that most of the accurate diagnostics with the specific ig antibodies can be done with the skin prick test yeah. the position paper of 2012 2017 also it has mentioned that the skin prick test is still preferable considering the cost of the therapy because hardly it is in indian scenario 100 inr allergen this uh, blood allergy test the specific immunocap it goes around 700 rupees per allergen uh, 700 inr and the other multiplex assay method also again one more problem is that this multiplex assay method has some of the indian allergens they may not have some of the pollens and all so again it becomes a problem the patient has to go for it both the tests so considering the awareness and the cost of therapy we always prefer the skin prick test in most of the cases when those children which have a significant food allergy then we go for the immunocap specific ig and all so if you see all the guidelines even the jina has also uh, insisted nowadays that allergy testing with the specific ig the standardization should be there we can help the patients so what is the difference between the serum ig level and skin prick is that skin prick test measures the reactivity of the mast cell mount ig while the blood circulating ig with the serum specific ig testing is picked up that's why some of the times it can have a false positive or false negative reaction and it is easily available within 40 minutes the patient get a report then 
the blood specific IG takes some time. The cost is also high. Only thing is, some of the child patients, which the so many skin is affected, or if they are on antihistaminics and all, then we have to wait for some time. So those cases are very small children. Then we can go for the blood specific IG. That's the only thing. And when if there is a significant dermatographism or hypersensitive skin or pregnant women and all, then the skin prick test generally we avoid it. So even with the standardization, you can see how the accuracy is much better than the blood specific IG. So positive predictive value of these uh, patients in uh, allergic rhinitis, it has a very good with the SPT. So it's a painless bloodless nowadays. So easy to demonstrate, hardly one millimeter lancet is there, more than three millimeter histamine and other allergens which come positive. We have to compare with the positive histamine. And you can see the previously used to have a three millimeter tip. Now, hardly one millimeter tip is used. So now, recently last one year, we are having this multiplex microarray assay method testing where we can identify around 120 allergens and 300 epitopes. If the peanut allergy patient is there, different type of epitopes like RIH123 proteins, we can identify. And if the child which is sensitive to RIH123, it may be risky for a severe anaphylaxis and all, and they should keep the adrenaline injections with that. In Indian scenario, we don't have adrenaline ready to use EP pain injection, but we make our usual adrenaline, you know, to see syringe, depending on the weight of the child, 10 kg 0.1 ml, 20 kg 0.2 ml, 30 kg 0.3 ml. And we ask the parents to keep with a spectacle case and it should not be exposed to the sunlight and all. Wherever possible, they can keep it in the freeze and they can carry anywhere. So it becomes cost effective. Even the, if the soy sensitivity is there, then the glyum, pio and eight storage proteins are affected with the clinical reactions up to severe anaphylaxis. <laughs> Differentiate with this microarray assay method and cross reactivity and sensitization with the lipid proteins, then cysteine proteinase, storage proteins also can be identified with this. And so that is useful in some of the patients which have weak triggered exercise induced anaphylaxis or uh, very severe food allergy suspected by the parents. We can go for that. And then the cross reactivity, like latex sensitivity has a multiple food cross reactivity. So both children, after eating some fruits, they get a symptoms. The parents blame the fruits, but actually it is a latex sensitivity. Even like a prawns or selfish cream, that topomycinin, which is having a dust mite cross reactivity, that's why the body feels that this has been exposed and the children or the adults, they show the reaction to the shrimp or the shellfish. But actually, it can be a cross reactivity. So we have to consider that in those cases with the insect and venoms also, we can determine with the this cross reactivity and the epitopes. So we can guide the patient about that, what type of precautions are all. Suppose somebody is having a milk sensitivity with the skin prick. But here, if it is a casein sensitivity more into the CRD, then the milk can be used in a baked or boiled form. So there is no need to worry much. So that way this helps. Awareness measures has to be educated to the most of the parents or the patients so that it helps them a lot for a long-term benefit. Simple precautions like that might in wash bedding in the hot water, dampness and humidity should be maintained. Exposure to the carpets and all the furniture should be avoided. Then pollen awareness, as I mentioned, during the winter, use the mask during the early morning walks or something. Then into the car also pollen filters can be used. If the pets are there, possibly they should be kept not on the sofas and uh, beds and all. So try to clean them properly. Then the vacuum cleaning like HEPA filter vacuum cleaner should be used. Cockroaches then avoid those type of measures for that also should be taken. The molds then cleaning with the liquid ammonia 5% should be done. And long-term wise, repair the damage or leakage, wherever it is there. So that helps the patients to reduce the medications overuse because a lot of steroids are used in Indian scenario. A lot of first generation antihistaminics and they have a lot of side effects. Even not only the direct, but the indirect effect amongst the drivers 
consuming this first generation antihistamines and causing accidents. It's a very big problem. So relative format physiotherapy, we should give it to the patients, but specific allergen immunotherapy in a selected patients with a very moderate to severe allergy, which does not respond effectively with the regular antihistamines or multilucas reporting receptor antagonists or inhaled therapies. The patient requires a very high inhaled corticosteroids and oral and parental corticosteroids. Then there, we can guide the patients about the allergen immunotherapy. It is basically the administration of the gradually increasing quantity of the vaccine in a sublingual, oral, or subcutaneous forms. And it will have a antibody, IgG1, IgG4 antibody formation into these patients. And it helps to develop a tolerance against the specific allergens. So which cases this immunotherapy has been advised? So all the Ig mediated diseases, specifically rhinopharyngitis, rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps also, if they require a surgery, I'll fix it. But further, they should not develop again a relapse of that. So if because of the hymenopter, like insect hypersensitivities or anaphylaxis, and specific few patients dermitis or significant allergic articaria only if it is significant very few patients but they will definitely require it so always ask the detailed history of the family parents first degree relative clinically examine into the patient any hidden signs of allergy and then decide about that and after the allergy test always clinically correlate use that allergen correlating according to our history and exposure so this th2 and th1 imbalance should be maintain and so that to have a long-term efficacy and control of the inflammation. So even 1998, the World Health Organization has published a paper that if you want to reduce the severity of the allergies and not only the that patient, but even some papers say to the next generation also the severity can be reduced with the proper management of the allergy. So even as I mentioned about the probiotics and biologics, now during the COVID, how the docilizumab were used now, monoclonal antibodies were used. Now, at least awareness about the interleukins has happened. But 2012, we did a study in Pune around 20 significant asthma, and we found significant TH2, IL 345, IL 13, were increased in these patients. So, there are a lot of studies worldwide, and these target therapies like omalizumab, dupilumab, mepolizumab, reflizumab, bendalizumab, azipilumab. We are doing trials of omalizumab, etikimab in asthma and pseudopedia also in Pune. So it has a very good recovery to the patients. And these monoclonal antibodies directly bind at the IG, which is getting bound to the FCR receptors and multiple actions also like anti-IL-5 receptor also in case of dupilumab and mepolizumab, bendalizumab. Such type of will reduce the corticosteroids repeatedly and we can reduce the anti allergics also. And there's a misconception among the population that the allergy testing and immunotherapy is costly or it is a time consuming. But if you see the symptom wise also, only medications, the patient may overcome the eczema or asthma, but later on he goes into rhinosinusitis, adult onset asthma, chronic respiratory disease. Now definitely the asthma COPD overlap syndrome also. So considering all these things, it requires a repeated medications. Only in between, there can be a window period or a dormant period. And later on, he goes through that. And where, if you manage the allergies and if required desensitization immunotherapy, how we can reduce significantly long-term medications and um, even the newer sensitivities. So even the annual cost also in these patients, long-term wise, definitely it helps to the patients. And Cost is very important in managing this patient because later on when they have pneumonia or secondary obstructive sleep apnea or so many things, they spend a lot of money and the quality of life is very poor. So summarizing, we need a better management of allergy diseases, not only the symptomatically also, to prevent the severe allergy asthma into the adulthood, to prevent the allergic march, then awareness among age-old outdated practices should be abandoned. Now we should use the standardized skin fit test or if you want to have a then blood specific Ig immunocap or component disorder diagnosis, type of immunoblot techniques and all should be used, not a ELISA and RAS testing. And then awareness measure to the community 
as well as the selective safe medications and the allergen immunotherapy as a disease modifying therapy so thank you thanks a lot thank you dr uh, vijay warat for that wonderful um, presentation uh, i have some questions may i ask yes professor please um i remember i remember reading a study a long time ago i think it was part of the tucson uh, study in arizona and where they had all these children um 6000 kids tracked from birth to 6 years old and they found that a, a big group of them weaned early a big group of them weaned later and a small group persistently weaned throughout the six years so um so it seems like the global um, um asthma um levels have doubled in the last 10 years if i'm not mistaken and um i i find in my own practice as well sometimes i come across uh, young young children or young you know teenagers with a lot of sinusitis and uh, you know have never been diagnosed and some of them um quite interestingly uh, because we have ct scan uh, uh, and a, and a nasal endoscopy is not so comfortable as well it doesn't quite you know really uh, diagnose sinusitis what are your thoughts that on this this uh, sinusitis in children yes sir absolutely i agree with you it affects the very bad the quality of life and even as i mentioned rhino conjunctivitis is a very big problem nowadays and it is causing a lot of keratoconus the repeated ocular steroids causing a early cataract early glaucoma we had a 19 years old girl she lost an eye because of the repeated eye steroids one six and a half years old child with a early age cataract so the people should be aware like rather than using those steroids and all they should have also the modern science uh, diagnostics and all they should be used in their practices thank you thank you very much uh, thank you uh, and any other any other questions from the floor oh is there picture on the facebook or hello somebody is asking hello yes sorab yes dr bukari yes so this is dr kaiser sajjad oh yes sir yes, oh, dr sajjad yes uh, hello everybody uh, uh dr vijay it was a fantastic excellent presentation uh, uh actually uh, uh, i miss a few parts of your uh, lecture uh, basically i am a ent surgeon so i enjoyed your uh, nasal allergy what about you have uh, said uh, my 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 uh, uh, experience is uh, i want to share that one of the most uh, uh, serious rather i can say the complication is uh, of the nasal allergy is the uh, 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 nasal polyp the sinus uh, sino nasal polyposis so this is one of the very common complication and yeah. the second one is the uh, bronchial asthma so those mm -hmm. who are not preventing themselves from the allergen uh, in pakistan we uh, see the lot of patients are suffering from the nasal polyposis or sinus polyposis so this is very common number one number two is my observation that the uh, regarding the treatment when we combine the uh, antihistamine with the montelukas uh, it is very helpful for the uh, allergic rhino uh, uh, allergic rhinitis so i don't know what is your uh, experience what you say about that uh, and uh, lastly my my my, uh, uh, my experience to be sure that the immune boost uh, i say i advise to the patient you have to improve your immunity uh, through good sleep through good uh, uh, diet and a uh, 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 plenty of uh, liquids and a uh, walk or exercise something so it it they all will increase your immunity if the immunity is increased you will uh, you will treat yourself uh, the allergies uh, different type or particularly the nasal or the throat allergy so this is uh, i i want to share with you uh, dr vijay thank you very much thank you dr kaiser actually absolutely agree with you uh, only thing is that 
as i mentioned there is a hypersensitivity so the most important is that to reduce the sensitivity see uh, the inflammation control symptomatically sometimes maybe because of multiple factors as like in a diabetes the stress also aggravates so like i will like to enlighten my 37000 severe children with asthma allergies during the first lockdown not a single parent called me because the children were very happy so did not develop any symptoms even besides all the smite sensitivity and all because the parents were at home they were used to all the food whatever they want and no schools no stress so a single stress management also can control the symptomatically the inflammation but the long term disease management the sensitivity development can also be prevented with the nasal douching nasal wash it's a very good thing like uh, traditionally in indian scenario nasal wash is done since thousands of years nowadays we are having all these improved bottles and saline solutions also ready to use they also should be used yes absolutely and the montulicast and all it is a very good drug in mild to persistent moderate severe allergies definitely monica do you have any thank you Thank yes. you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Rao. It's such a fantastic presentation. I can't believe how many topics and the depth and the breadth of what you had discussed today uh, was covered. And the the best thing about our field um, as is that we take care of the patient in their environment. We take care of the patient within their family, and we see that atopic diseases are clustered within families so not only do we take care of the child or the adult but we take care of the entire uh, family um so it's really nice to hear the um the indian perspective and i want to share now um kind of a, a little bit about what the experience is uh from where i practice so starting with your uh your th1 th2 skewing this is phenomenal We see that as you live in an environment with more coliform bacteria that you skew towards a Th1 your immune system is busy it's busy fighting infections it doesn't have time to rev up the Th2 which is responsible for your atopic diseases um your Th2 are your eosinophils your B cells that create IgE it's the interleukins of IL4 IL5 IL13 the hormones that promote allergic eosinophilic inflammation so we see that skewing and i and that's part of the hygiene hypothesis that living in a very sterile environment makes our immune system so to speak bored and then it becomes overactive in the atopic Th2 world fantastic mention of that the second thing you talked about and you kept re reviewing this was the atopic march so the atopic march represents four different atopic conditions that start with infancy and progresses through an individual's life an individual might have all four stages may have one or two stages or you might see spattering of severity of each of these four diseases among different members of the family somebody might have eczema somebody might have asthma these four conditions in order of appearance is atopic dermatitis which is an eczematous dermatitis that can be complicated by allergic contact dermatitis your lotions your perfumes the metals you also then develop ige mediated food allergy most commonly milk egg then going to nuts like peanuts tree nuts fish and shellfish soy and now more recently in the united states they've labeled now labeling laws for sesame seeds we then talk about seasonal environmental allergies calling causing allergic rhinosinusitis allergic conjunctivitis and then developing to asthma whether it be atopic asthma or, or non atopic asthma th1 or th2 or th2 high or th2 low asthma so I want to talk about each of these four conditions in in a little bit more detail. So eczematous dermatitis has faced a a huge explosion of medical therapies today that we didn't have like several day, years ago. Uh there's a lot of more focus now on personalized therapy addressing these IL3, IL4, IL13, the interleukins, the eosinophils, and we now have relief for kids who have moderate to severe eczema 
with medications beyond topical steroids with the use of Dupixent, which is an injection. Very expensive medication. Not everybody wants to do a shot, but we now have an option that wasn't there before. Okay, I'm gonna swing over to food allergies now. If you have moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, you are at higher risk for food allergies. Your skin is developing, it's producing so much IgE that your immune system is revved up, sloppy, and then all of a sudden, when you have a new food introduction, you might develop IgE to that new food when you have high uh, IgE levels and you have eczema. So the current guidelines based on the learning early about peanut allergy and with today's topic of food prevention is to safely introduce high allergenic foods early in infancy before the age of one, whereas the prior American Association of Pediatric Guidelines was to introduce foods at age four or older. So what do I do? If I have a pediatrician, I have a dermatologist that said, hey, this kid has moderate to severe eczema, skin test to peanut, we have guidelines, peanut skin test is less than eight millimeters on the wheel. We will then recommend home introduction if the family is not um, comfortable, we will do an observed food challenge. The goal being, and this is why we saw very few food allergies in our culture is that we used to do early food introduction. We never used to follow this, like eat peanuts at age four. We were feeding peanuts to our kids when they were infants. But as the guidelines change, as people followed the guidelines of the countries they were in, we noticed that there was an increase in food allergies. This is called the learning about food, uh, peanut allergy or the LEAP study. There's been additions that have been done to that study and we've now extrapolated that data and we've applied it to other foods, milk, egg, other stuff that we should do safe early introduction before the kid's immune system is solidified to recognize it as an IgE mediated food allergy. Also talking about food allergies, I wanna talk about two other things. One is, is that we never recommend new food introduction when a child has a viral infection. If their immune system is revved up because they have a cold, they're more likely to develop hives when they have a new food introduction that gets inappropriately attributed to the food. The patient then avoids it and then later on reintroduces it and has now a food allergy. So if a child has a few hives with food introduction during a viral illness, the viral illness is more likely the cause of the hives. The hives is not an allergic disease, it's an immune disease. And that peanut should be readdressed, readdressed as quickly as possible in an observed setting. Talking about component testing, what he meant by component testing is say you look at the peanut itself. If you pull out the peanut um, uh, allergen in terms of a protein, I think of it as Lego blocks, little Lego blocks that are together. And I'm looking for the peanut component, like I'm looking for a yellow and a red and a yellow brick together. That's your era H1. Era H2 is your blue, blue, and blue. If you have three blues and you have elevated of era H2, that confers a higher risk of peanut allergy. So we use component derived analysis to be able to risk stratify peanut allergy testing. So the world is not binary. It's not black and white. We use a composite picture. We have to clinically correlate. We look at the history. We look at the food exposure. We look at, was it the seventh time they were exposed to peanut? The first time they were exposed to peanut? Did the symptoms happen two hours later, 20 minutes later, the severity of the um, uh, reaction, the comorbid conditions, and what the component testing is? What we then do is even if the skin testing is positive, I food challenge almost all those kids. I don't use a food uh, test as a diagnosis of allergy. I just use it as a composite. And so therefore it is very important that you have an allergist involved that uses their experience and can explain it to the patients. Because anybody who's listening to this talk, if they feel, hey, I should just go get a peanut test. I can get a blood test, I can walk over that's not enough for a diagnosis. You need somebody who has been trained to understand what's known as a positive predictive value, the negative predictive value, the rate of false positive, rate of false negatives when it comes to food allergy testing. In the United States, we never recommend panel testing. Oh, my child has allergies, my child has eczema. Let me get a food test for 30 foods. We don't do it. Our food allergy testing is guided by history. So maybe I will skin test a child to a peanut if their sibling has a high risk peanut allergy, but in the absence of something like that, 
I say there, this child is its own person. We are going to not assume that that child has a peanut allergy until we figure out the normal guidelines. Okay, I went a long way about that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. absolutely. It was very okay. informative. Thanks for okay. that. Really I'll keep going. So let's that was, that was diagnosis number two. So the third diagnosis is allergies, allergic rhinitis, allergic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyposis. Huge huge bucket of diagnoses right there, broad spectrum. Okay, seasonal allergies, environmental allergies, indoor, outdoor. Why do we test for allergies? We're trying to establish a pattern. If a child has a stuffy nose, a runny nose, an adult has a stuffy nose, runny nose, is it a virus? Is it allergies? If we skin test and identify inhalant allergens, we could then say, hey, like for example, in North America, I'll say ragweed counts are high. You are always having a runny nose in August. Therefore, it's likely to be a ragweed allergy, or it could be that your child started school and they're also, you know, being exposed to viruses. When we recommend the guidelines for allergies, and this is why steroid nose sprays went over the counter, got FDA approval, where they used to be required by prescription, is that using a consistent low dose inhaled steroid, inhaled steroid fluticasone, mometasone, budesonide, trimcinolone, is considered to be far superior, far safer than using consistent use of antihistamines. We do not recommend Allegra or Fexofenadine a day, we, every day. We do not recommend Loratadine every day. The only time that I recommend antihistamines every day is somebody has chronic highs. For people who have environmental allergies, antihistamines are always PRN, inhaled steroids are done on a scheduled basis. Takes two weeks to work, no immediate gratification. You gotta stick with it. Aim the steroid nail spray to the same side ears. Okay, so flipping over to polyps. Now that is a different diagnosis. So polyps can be eosinophilic or it can be neutral, neutrophilic. If you have cystic fibrosis, it has a different immune basis. If you have eosinophilic nasal polyposis, which is the burden of the disease that we see in the allergic allergy clinic, that can be associated or it cannot be associated with asthma. The skin lining the inside of the sinuses and the nose and the lung is the same respiratory epithelium. If you are overproducing eosinophilic inflammation in your sinuses, similar inflammation is happening in your lungs. So when ENT is noticing that they have a lot of nasal polyp patients that have asthma, that's an immediate evaluation by an allergist who should be doing spirometry or peak flow assessments, uh, maybe even exhaled nitric oxide to look for the degree of, of, of inflammation. Intranasal steroids, budesonide irrigation for nasal polyp prevention is very important, and so is use of inhaled steroids for asthma. We're in a new world, direct therapy. We have depolumumab or dupixin, we have mepolumumab, uh, mepolizumab, which is uh, nucala, and we have omalizumab or zolair that have all been approved for nasal polyposis that are eosinophilic phenotype. There is no prevention of this disease. Some patients are more predisposed to develop recurrent nasal polyposis, and it is imperative to treat them because when they lose their sense of smell, they cannot smell smoke. It's a security issue for safety if there's a safety file hazard, and it is also a quality of life issue. They cannot taste their food. To give that back, and we understand what all these symptoms mean with COVID, but we've been asking these questions even before COVID because of people who have had nasal polyposis. A word about Montelukast, leukotriene receptor antagonist. Non-antihistamine does not cause sedation. Very safe. However, in March of 2020, the week before the pandemic was declared in the United States, the FDA came out with a black box warning. That black box warning said that leukotriene receptor antagonist, Montelukast, can cause neuropsychiatric side effects. We had been noticing the side effect for about 10 years before that FDA warning came up. I will tell you that Montelukast crosses the blood brain barrier. If you notice that you have mood swings, that you are aggressive, that you are sad, since you started Montelukast, please don't take it. Please use your steroid nose spray. So Montelukast is safe. Yes, it doesn't have a lot of the other side effects, but go into it knowing that there is a potential side effect and then understand the risk benefit of taking this medication as you do for everything else. Okay, so that was a lot about nasal stuff. Last thing, asthma. Okay, asthma can have internal or external or intrinsic or extrinsic triggers. 
if you are around somebody who has who smokes, so that's secondhand smoke, or that same grandparent that was smoking outside and comes back in and has smoke residue on their clothing, that is called thirdhand smoke. Smoke exposure plus um, pollution that you notice in um, um, next to roads and living near highways, um, air quality that you just talked about with the crops, these are all things that can exacerbate pre-existing asthma. But with respect to prevention and understanding disease prog progression, you did mention um, the Arizona study, and I actually don't know what that cohort found, but I do know that there was a study done by Siggers. And what that said is that if you were hospitalized with um, RSV bronchiolitis before the age of three, you are more likely to develop persistent asthma at the age of seven. We then have the asthma predictive index. It's also based on a whole bunch of factors and there are ways for you to know whether or not um, you have um, asthma. The asthma prevention is based on uh, avoidance of viral triggers, avoidance of allergen triggers, and being able to treat with appropriate medications quickly and to avoid the use of oral or systemic corticosteroids by maintaining with the use of inhaled steroids like a combination of budesonide for moderol, where in most of the world it can be used as a rescue inhaler as well as a controller at the same time. So in one inhaler, you get to use both. Okay, um, allergy approach is an approach of composite factors, history, it's also testing, and it's also a discussion about the risk benefit profile and every patient should be engaged um, using a very patient-centered approach. Um, clinical correlation is always required, which you already mentioned, that looking at our testing results, does it actually match what the patient is saying? And it's also really important to understand that a person changes at different stages of their life. If you look at women who are pregnant or go through menopause or go through puberty, their asthma and allergy profile will change with their life, as will their profile in different environments. So I just wanted to summarize kind of like my experience um, in terms of my practice. And I wanted to say thank you for a phenomenal presentation. And all I did was just piggyback on what you had already said. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, think, I think it covers up very well. Um, anybody else has a question before we end the meeting? Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Sarab, I want to ask one question. Yeah, Dr. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Vajay for your uh, nice presentation. Most of my feedback and discussion has been covered by Dr. Monica. Uh, but I think uh, time is too much, but only one thing that I want to ask from you. There are so many things that are covered by you both, uh, uh, genius uh, teachers. Uh, what is the role of uh, uh, probiotics and uh, which type of probiotics? I think this topic has not covered by Dr. Monica that I want to raise it. What is the role of this one and which type of money, uh, probiotics? Because the type of allergy in Indo Park, where the 25% of the population all over the world is living here, is different as compared to America. We are not America, not Canada, because we are in this population. What we will believe on this. Can you give some comments uh, about probiotics? Which type of probiotics will be more protective for this allergic? Thank you so much. Considering the Indian scenario, we have found lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. Then bifidobacterium, then bacillus clausii, saccharomyces boulardii. These are the documented probiotics which have shown some benefits in different type of diseases. So that way, lactobacillus rotary and all for the infantile colics and all, they have been added into some milk products also nowadays. So that way. But still, we have to go a lot because these are all studies done outside most of the studies. They haven't been done in Indian scenario. That's a very problem. So our gut microbiota are different, our diet is different. Till we don't have our own studies, we can't say firmly he like they really benefit because most of the studies have been done in Western countries. I agree. And I also think that the Asian diet is phenomenal. Yeah. Like if you think about the microbiome, I mean, I grew up eating yogurt every day, every meal. 
<laughs> right? I mean, that was, and you know, probiotics work when you use it every day. You use it the day it works, you don't use it the next day. And the tendency in the swing to the Western diet, and it's all prepackaged food. I mean, I think when it comes to gut health, that's overall health. Our gut is our largest immune organ. And if we keep our gut happy, then you'll keep the rest of your yeah. body happy. Yeah. And yes, yeah. and I agree with you. Um, but I think that there's obviously not case controlled studies yeah. to look at one over another. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for this one. That is why most of the people are not suffering with the allergy. If we see the prevalence of allergy all over the world, it's a hardly 10 to 30 percent of different types. And most of the people are protective. These, these, we are using these all things, especially in our countries. We early in the morning, our mothers, when we are a child, they gave the uh, lassi and this yogurt and all this. I think these all things are in, are protective for the immunity. Thank you so much once again, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think in the interest of time, we would like to wind up the session. Thank you. Uh, this was an excellent, uh, I think, session by Dr. Vijay and followed up with uh, Dr. Monica. Uh, I think there was a comment from Angelica saying that you should take a full session as well. So I will follow up with you for that. But uh, thank you uh, everyone for joining in. and. Uh, Stay tuned for the next session. We will report, uh, we will inform the session again. So thank you so much for joining in. See you again.